Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Ryan, veterinary behavior residency trained and a veterinarian. And I'm Dr. Serena. I'm also a veterinarian and currently pursuing my veterinary behavior residency. So the last topic, we were chatting about separation anxiety, and we were talking about the differential diagnoses of separation anxiety. So I think you wanted to talk about our approach to a case because it's a very common problem for uh, dog parents. Yeah. So it's very, very easy to blame separation related disorders or separation anxiety in the, in the old term uh, terminology. Uh, it's very easy to blame that uh, as an excuse or use that as an excuse for the dog's behavior when the owners are away. But because of what we know in our experience, we don't always jump to the conclusion that this is it. And uh, I kind of like, we kind of discussed it and kind of like touched it a little bit uh, in the last episode. And if you're interested, there's going to be a link below or, you know, just see the previous one. But for example, a person that's telling you that the dog is actually eating normally or maybe even eating more than the usual might not always be that. It might, by the way, some kind of like in people might actually, uh, anxiety will cause them to overeat. But for separation anxiety, it's kind of like, I would say the outlier. It's usually not the case. So I will start let's uh, we can talk about like how we diagnose the the thing uh, that or that specific behavior but i will say that the tool that i use the most and i think is probably the best way to diagnose separation anxiety or anything like that is a camera do you, do you agree with me yes of course <laughs> So, so now, nowadays, and, and it's, I mean, it sounds so stupid maybe, but uh, it's so, so, so important nowadays. And it's very easy because you can buy those uh, cameras that have uh, either a subscription program, but some of them, you don't even need to have any subscriptions or anything like that. I have something called uh, Waze. It's W-Y-Z-E. Uh, it's, if I remember correctly, it doesn't have, you don't really need to have the subscription and it will give you alerts when the dog is barking or when the dog is moving around and you can have even set up like a specific perimeter in, in the picture. So, you know, if your dog is just moving around the bed then, and you don't mind, or you don't think it has anything to do with the dog's behavior, you can kind of like leave that out and only put the door uh next to the to the dog or whatever uh, that it will send you alerts and then you can either watch the recording so that camera definitely has an sd a micro sd card that you can put inside and then review the videos later even if you might not be able to review it live because let's be honest most people don't really have the time to sit and look at their phone and see what their dog is doing. So having something that actually records the dog is very, very convenient, very easy. And what I ask the owners to do at the beginning, uh, so we can actually get to the diagnosis, but even later on for the treatment is to create like an Excel sheet or some sort of a journal and write what the dog was doing. And like saying that between this and this time, the dog was barking. Between this and this, the dog was sleeping. Between this and this, the dog was drooling or, you know, everything basically that you can uh, think of because that can help us diagnose. You'll be surprised of the times that people thought their dog had separation anxiety. And once they started recording the dog when he's alone, they found out that he was actually responding to barks from the outside mm -hmm. and it wasn't separation anxiety. It was frustration or boredom or even like a playful behavior. Yeah. 
or or like normal territorial behavior if he's exactly. hearing a do- another dog outside of his yes. his uh territory mm-hmm. uh, but yes absolutely getting a camera um so recently i had a client who's who basically said my dog has separation anxiety same same as the 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 reddit post that you had shared with us my dog has separation anxiety they uh, filmed right before leaving and then I said what does he do when you're actually gone oh he sleeps mm-hmm. so I don't think it's necessarily separation related disorder that we're dealing with and it might be frustration maybe he has FOMO mm-hmm. he doesn't want to be left behind <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> now, even even with, with my own dogs, I mean, one of them now actually does have separation anxiety. But a, a long time ago, we had the neighbor complaining that he's barking all day long, and it was true that when we were leaving, we would hear him bark, and when we would come back, we would hear him bark. But we didn't know what happened in between in those few hours that were. No, in between. So, yeah. and you have someone coming and telling you that the dog is barking nonstop and you kind of believe them, but I didn't. So I used the, the camera and I actually found out that he would bark like 15 minutes at the beginning, 15 minutes, um, not 15 minutes, like only when he heard us coming back or if someone was, you know, like actively getting to the door and you know like making noise in the hallway or something like that mm-hmm. which is also a normal behavior you mentioned territorial behavior that's another reason why people have dogs to to defend their house to protect the house to be territorial and yeah. you know we can't complain when the dog is being territorial it sounds like cola agrees right <laughs> hey you cola <laughs> <laughs> um that was that was my that was my um fear was contributing to a dog that was gonna have separation anxiety. Mm. But she's she's been she's been in her X pen for an hour and a half or two hours now. So yeah, she's she's getting uh, she just woke up from her nap, so I'm actually just gonna let her outside. Sure, sure. <laughs> While you're doing it, uh I'll say that the next thing that I usually look for are those, you know, different behaviors that we also mentioned uh, the last uh, episode that we made, kind of like the destructive behaviors or the house soiling only when the dog is alone, but not in different situations. Uh, I would like to kind of like make sure that there aren't any loud noises or outside triggers because for example uh, it is very common that a dog with noise phobia will also have separation anxiety and vice versa so i always try to also rule out those things and and make sure there aren't any other triggers causing it as well uh, to kind of like get to a conclusion that we are talking about separation anxiety what what other behaviors or other things would you look for to kind of like get to a diagnosis of separation related behaviors so the lack of sleep if they aren't sleeping which i touched on in the previous yeah um video um if there's a lot of drooling pacing panting um if there's a lot of uh destruction or clawing at the exit of where the humans were Mm -hmm. versus other areas of the house. Um, Because if you're having destruction at the exit, that could be more common with a separation related problem. Um, Not eating, which you already mentioned. Um, It's very, very common for dogs who have anxiety to not eat. Um, Or if they're fearful or in panic, they won't eat. And that has to do with the uh, increase in the sympathetic tone versus the parasympathetic tone. The parasympathetic mm-hmm. being our rest and digest, the sympathetic being our fight or flight. Um, so if 
that parasympathetic nervous system isn't turned on, you're going to have less sleep, you're going to have less rest, you're going to have less eating. Um, so that would be my kind of like expectation for dogs who have the diagnosis of a separation related disorder. Yeah, and, and you basically said both things, but I'm kind of like wanna uh, put an emphasis on it to kind of like, not intentionally, but to show how confusing it can be that a dog with separation anxiety can be very active. And as you said, like would roam around the house and will not sleep, would not be able to, uh, to rest or relax even for a second. But on the other side of the scale, they, they still wouldn't be able to sleep and rest, but they will lay down and would freeze basically and stare at the door and not move the entire time other than like holding their head up from time to time or, or you know, you could see their ears moving uh, towards the door, towards different sounds and stuff like that. And yeah. that's another reason why videos are very good in order to get to uh, a diagnosis and even later for the treatment. Because some people would say, okay, my dog doesn't have separation anxiety because he's yeah. not active and he's not barking. But you see that the dog spends those, I don't know, four, six hours awake staring at the dog in the door and not doing anything other than staring, 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 then that's not normal. That's yeah, not, it's normal not normal behavior. Not Maybe normal. more more acceptable to most people because the dog is not causing damage or not causing the neighbors to complain, but it's definitely yeah. not a normal thing. Yeah. Um, separation re related disorders are often comorbid with other disorders. So you mentioned noise sensitivity as being one of them. So when we have a behavior case that even if they're not presenting for separation related disorder, they're presenting for leash reactivity or something like that. Yeah. I still want a video of the departures yeah. because if that dog is not sleeping well, the walk in the evening will be worse. Mm -hmm. And the pet parent might not be able to identify it without taking a video. Yeah. So let's say that we did get to a diagnosis and it is a separation related behavior. What would be your uh, first recommendation as for treatment? I My first recommendation is building some sort of safe place for them it doesn't necessarily need to be a crate and we touched on this before it's individual dependent but usually a bedroom usually a bedroom with a crate if they do well in a crate if there's multiple dogs in the house if they do better with one dog than being alone then I try to get the pet parents to train both dogs at the same time but there might be one that's more disruptive or maybe one that can't handle being in the bedroom alone, uh, then I ask them to train them separately. So mm -hmm. some, some sort of safe place. Some dogs like to sleep in the closet. Yeah. There's no and reason you, why you we can't have them in a car. Would you, would you recommend, sorry uh, for cutting you off. Would you recommend like adopting another dog in order to no so good. <laughs> oh i'm asking because i know that it's a question that many people ask us and i know that it's something that sadly many people including veterinarians do recommend like bring another dog so that your dog will have a friend and then they're not feeling that they're separated yeah so the it's it's has to do with the fact that that dog is being separated from its attachment figure and you can't expect the dog to have the same attachment with a new dog that comes in yeah um if you're lucky they're going to get along really great if you're you know so so they're going to be tolerant of each other but what if you have now two dogs that don't get along and now you have to manage two dogs so, which has actually happened um, mm -hmm. with one of my cases, a dog who 
had all sorts of behavior issues and they thought I'm going to get a dog for this dog. And then he started attacking the new dog. And so now they had a whole new problem that they weren't dealing with when he was the only dog in the house. Yeah, no, that's, that's, I completely, completely agree. And not to mention, you know, someone having the, I mean, being very, very unlucky and getting two dogs with separa separation related behaviors or disorders. And now he has to deal with two dogs with separation anxiety uh, in sale, yeah. just the one. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, no. So, so yeah, I, I completely agree. Bringing another dog is definitely not, uh, not something I recommend. <laughs> I will say that. In my case, and uh, I don't know, maybe it's because of the cases that, that I mostly see. Uh, and, you know, we usually see the more complicated cases, right? I mean, because if it's not too bad, then usually it will be solved even before they come to see us. We're usually getting the, the really bad ones. Yeah, And in my experience, most of the patients that I got sadly didn't respond to just, you know, routine and working on, you know, counter conditioning and desensitization to living or even yeah. to being alone. So, you know, there are many times you would hear like uh, recommendations or, or suggestions on like, and leave the the house for like a second and come back and then two seconds and come back and so on, which might take forever basically. Uh, in my experience, it, it, it never works. Not rarely, never. I never saw a dog that got better. Uh, and again, maybe because the dogs that I'm seeing are usually a lot harder, but I never saw that any of them responded well to things like that. And that's why uh, we actually use quite a lot of anti-anxiety medications to actually help the dog reduce the anxiety, and then we're able to do things like that. But yeah, you know, not before. What What do you think? Yeah. I agree. If it is so severe that it's affecting the human's quality of life and the dog's quality of life, because it's a pair that probably is both. Um, suffering from anxiety because there's pet parents that just they feel guilty for leaving their dog and then they can't they basically rearrange their entire life for their dog mm -hmm. um, so I start them on an as-needed medication so medication they give prior to departures and a daily anti-anxiety medication Mm -hmm. So the as needed medication might be a sedative, mm -hmm. but my goal is for them to sleep when the pet parent isn't there. There's no reason that they need to be awake. Mm -hmm. So you usually start with both. You usually start with both the daily medication and the as needed, or do you like try, yep. let's say the as needed, the, the fast acting medication first and see if it's effective and only then decide if you want to add because if the goal is to train them, my as-needed medications are hypnotics mm -hmm. or sedatives. And so if I'm giving them an as-needed medication that's going to sedate them, they can't be trained when they're sleeping. Mm -hmm. So I want to start a daily anxiolytic so that in six to eight weeks, we can actually start the training. But I need a calmer dog first before the training. Got it. But so if I give them like, what, like ace promazine? I actually don't use ace promazine. But, so what, what hypnotics do you use? Um, so I use trazodone or a mm -hmm. benzodiazepine, depending on the dog. Mm -hmm. I have also used clonidine. Okay. No, no, get here. It's, it's, it's important to, to know because there's a big difference. Uh, all of those do have, uh, and they're not just sedatives. They're actually also, you know, affect serotonin or uh, affect uh, GABA or all kinds of, you know, mm -hmm. other systems in the brain. Uh, and that's usually kind of like how I uh, I promote them. 
I can say, look, this is not just a set. It might also cause yeah. sedation, which is not the end of the yeah. world for a dog that's, you know, staying alone, but they will also reduce the, the anxiety, uh, yeah. hopefully. And then yeah. again, kind of like making things easier. And unlike Ace Promising that I mentioned, that doesn't have anti-anxiety properties. Yeah. Uh, it will not uh, dog out. is a tranquilizer. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I don't use Um, But I think that things none of us do anymore, or almost never, never use them. I think that I think there probably are scenarios where you might use it. Um, isn't the chill protocol acepromazine, melatonin kind of stuff like? Yeah, but I think I don't. Use, I don't do use the treat like chill protocol. Dexamethasone or something. Uh, so it's kind of like a combination. It never comes just the ACE like it used to come in the past, because that was like the drug that everyone used. I don't know, like twenty years ago, and said this still some some use it uh, even nowadays, because it might cause the dog to look like he's calmer, but. It's not really causing him to be calmer. It's, as you mentioned, it's kind of like uh, knocking him out. But the problem is that I, when, when people or when other veterinarians ask me about using this medication, I say it's probably like being, in, like having a really bad trip. It's like everything is weird, probably. You don't know what's going on. Uh, but we do know that those dogs, if you... If the trigger is strong enough, they will still have a reaction. So for example, using that without giving them something for anxiety, and if you use that for, for example, aggression, it might be dangerous. You might actually get bitten because the dog is kind of like out of it, out of it, out of it. All of a sudden, it, he bites you. Yeah. But the same can be said with trazodone as well. Mm -hmm. So if you've... I mean, most most of us have gone through the psychopharmacology um, book by Stahl. Yeah. Uh, where trazodone is used for insomnia in people. And so it first binds antihistamine or is an antihistamine first. And so if you take a Benadryl, you're going to be sleepy. You shouldn't be yeah. driving. Um, and then later, 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 it's very weak serotonin reuptake inhibition very yeah weird. but that also depends on the dosage right because the lower dosages affect spe like specific receptors and the higher dosages will have the, the more effect on uh, the anxiety as well and that's yeah. why that's also true that's like for behavior i usually don't use the same dosages as someone will use post-surgery I will actually use the higher dosages. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that you actually get the serotonin reuptake exactly. inhibition, increase in serotonin, decrease. Yeah. Because, you know, I care more about the anxiety, uh, relieving properties and less the sedation. The, ca the cage race. Yeah. Bonus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, benzodiazepines like Xanax and uh, uh, clonazepam and clonazepate and all of those. Uh, they can be great options because, you know, kind of like in people, they also uh, help a lot with anxiety and stuff like that. But on the other hand, one of the side effects would be increased appetite. So we mentioned mm -hmm. in the last episode, the dog that would actually eat or scavenge around the house, trying to look for food or pica and stuff like that, the benzodiazepines you need to know that this can be a side effect. And then yeah. you give your dog a Xanax, he might actually start eating everything and destroying the house because he feels like he's hungry. And yeah. it's not because he's anxious anymore, but because of the side effect of the medication. Yeah. So you have to be very selective with benzodiazepines. And um, I'm not sure if if you have that sort of thought as well as also not just selective about the dogs that you prescribe benzodiazepines to, but also the pet parent because of, oh, the for sure. of benzodiazepines in humans. Um, but there would be a select few that we might benefit from. So the ones that are like yeah. frozen and don't want to eat when their humans are gone. Um, yeah. 
non-aggressive patients because benzodiazepines can be contraindicative for aggression. Mm -hmm. Uh, But there's also that side effect of paradoxical excitation where now you have a dog who's more amped up. (laughs) Yeah. When you want the dog to be sleeping. That's true. That's true. That's that's why you should probably not just medicate your dog with the medications that we're we were kind of like describing today or saying our options, but actually do get some recommendations from a veterinarian or or even veterinary behaviorist because we kind of know exactly what to warn you from. And we, I guess we would have better, better ways or more, more experience in uh, selecting the right medications to the right dogs and, and, the, and the right uh, pet owner. Yeah. My, you know, because of the state where I live in, uh, using medications that are control substances like the benzodiazepines, it's, it's really hard. It's really hard to... To kind of like use them uh, or refill them because the owners actually need to get a paper script from me and we can do it with refills. So every single month they need to come for a new script. Mm-hmm. And that's why I don't think I used it too much in the past three years, probably. But before mm-hmm. that, when I was still uh, in Indiana, it's easier because then you can just pick up the phone, call the pharmacy and ask for the medication with the refills, even if it is a controlled substance, at least that's how it was a few years ago. I don't know if it's still the way, uh, the same right now, but right. you know, it was easy. Uh, but let's talk about the, uh, you said the daily medications. So we do actually have two medications that are FDA approved for that specific problem for the separation anxiety. Yeah. Uh, one is the fluoxetine or Prozac, which the, the, the brand that is approved is called the uh, uh, Reconcile. Reconcile, I, I don't know, everyone pronounces it differently. Uh, and the other one is Clomipramine uh, or the actual brand that's called a uh, Clomicone. Uh, these are two different families of medications. The clomicon is a tricyclic antidepressant and uh, the reconcile is an SSRI. It's a, a select serotonin selective reuptake inhibitor. Uh, they both affect serotonin and actually they both affect other things as well. But because these two medications are actually labeled for separation anxiety, I think that in my case, and I wouldn't be surprised that many others do the same, these are probably the go-to medications before I start using off-label medications. Is that the same with you? Yeah, for sure. So um, whether I'm prescribing Reconcile or Clomacalm uh, or reaching for the human generic Mm. does end up being um, the cost and size of the tablets or capsules. Uh, That being said, there's been a little bit of research that Reconcile itself is more bioavailable in the dog than it is uh, with like the human generic. And that each human generic you can have different effects. So APO versus TIVA, uh, Mm. you might, like if you go to a different pharmacy and you end up with a different generic and you see a completely different effect or no effect, or maybe it was, they were doing really well and they were stable and then you switch generic. Um, Just sort of keeping that in mind as well for those pet parents who are using fluoxetine, Prozac, generic, Prozac, whatever you're using out there, so that Reconcile is actually considered um, better. And that's why it's dosed. Like, for instance, you have an eight milligram would be the equivalent as a te- as a 10 milligram of the generic. Yeah. yeah. And they make it like a treat. So you don't have, hopefully, you don't have to fight the dog over giving him the medication. 
Now, I usually start with the fluoxetine, with the reconcile, because uh, in most cases, you can use it as a once a day medication. Yeah. Unlike many of the other medications that we might need to use uh, twice a day or even three times a day sometimes. Yeah. It's also the medication that's had the most research. Um, yeah. Fluoxetine in general is like what, the 1970s? Mm -hmm. um, so we have a ton of research on using fluoxetine versus any of the other SSRIs or using any of the TCAs. Um, the only time that I might reach for clomipramine or clomacom first is if my patient get stress-induced colitis oh, mm -hmm. because of the uh, acetylcholine um, binding that I can get with a TCA that is not in the fluoxetine. Mm -hmm. So that would be the only kind of case where I'm like, hmm, your dog has diarrhea every time you leave the house. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's that. Those are the ones where where I'm like using one of the side effects of a medication for an appropriate effect. Yes. Yeah. Now people people need to understand. Uh, you know, I, I, let me let me tell it in a way of a, a a quick story of something that happened to me. So again, usually it happens uh, when I'm doing like uh, the general practice uh, work, not when I'm doing the behavior stuff. So someone, a client came uh, over and he said something like um, that he feels like all I'm doing is doing the physical exam, taking the history and looking at the previous records and then guessing what the problem uh, the dog has and kind of like what the treatment should be. So yeah, that's actually exactly what I'm doing. That's educated guess, and that's that medicine. We take history, we do a physical exam, but many times, you know, we, we don't MRI or CT every single dog that walks into the room. We don't sure. do millions of, of different tests that are probably not necessary in every single dog. So many times we are not sure what the diagnosis is, but we can do those educated guesses from all the information that we have. And yeah. then the treatment, you know, some, some conditions might have different medications that we can use. So especially like behavior uh, issues, we have different families. Each family has different uh, medications in it. So let's say you tried the fluoxetine, the, the reconcile, and it caused the dog to have uh, GI issues, gastrointestinal issues. You tried the clomipramine, the dog still had uh, GI issues. Then maybe you want to try acetalopram, or you, maybe you want to try paroxetine that are also an SSRI, but they're not exactly the same. So they might actually have a different effect. Yeah, so, sure. so yes. We are guessing many times, educated guesses. It's not the same as just randomly throwing something at the dog, hoping <laughs> and, uh, that it can do something, because then you don't need to pay us all that money. Uh, but, but yeah, there is some amount of guessing, and there's a lot of trial and error. In behavior, there's tons of trial and error. Absolutely. Yeah, I would say that in behavior, more so than any other Yes. Discipline in veterinary medicine yeah. is the tri this trial and error. Right. Um, maybe the other equivalent is rehab, uh, like physical rehab, <laughs> because they might be trying meloxicam and get GI abscess and they're trying to find an appropriate pain control for their mm -hmm. osteoarthritic dogs. Yeah. Um, no, I think, but, I think it's harder for us. <laughs> for, our, for our patients and for our, uh, yeah, it's definitely harder. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I think it's probably harder, but, um, one thing that I wanted to touch on as well, while we're talking about SSRIs is that, um, how do you feel when we're using fluoxetine and trazodone together? Are you concerned about serotonin syndrome? Yeah. So, 
serotonin syndrome is caused by too much serotonin in the body. So usually we use the medications that increase serotonin. I mean, if we're doing it on purpose, because actually there are other medications that might increase serotonin, but we're using them for like a whole different reason or something like that. So, you know, you always want your veterinarian to know that your dog is on a behavioral treatment so they can make sure there are no counter uh, contraindications with the other medications. But but yeah, so both uh, fluoxetine or Reconcile and actually Clomipramine uh, and Trazodone, they all increase serotonin, not exactly in the same mechanism, but the the result is more more serotonin in the brain. The serotonin is is one of the neurotransmitters uh, in the brain, and in dogs with and people with behavioral issues, there might be either low levels of serotonin or the receptors don't respond the same. We we actually don't really know for sure. There are like different theories on the uh, yeah. on why it's they effective. don't even. They don't know in people too. So yeah, yeah. No, uh, it's, just it's, for it's just for those of you out there who are like, exactly. oh, you guys don't know what you're doing. It, exactly. Is that they yeah. they don't these receptors are so small and they're so like there's so many different receptors that yeah. I don't even think that they have identified all of the serotonin receptors in their brain. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if they're like probably 50 more than the, the ones they already know. Uh yeah. but yeah, even in like install in the psychopharmacology book that that people basically use uh they say that they're like different theories on why there are issues and why increasing the serotonin might help but we don't know but basically that's what we do we try to increase the right. serotonin and like have effect on the receptors and all of that hmm. the serotonin syndrome will happen if we have too much serotonin and that makes people kind of like think more should we use uh, more than one medication that increases the serotonin in the body or in the brain and the body? And the answer is yes. Uh, I would definitely use trazodone and uh, reconcile or fluoxetine at the same time. I will change the dosage that I will use. So for example, if I use trazodone by itself, I will easily go up to, let's say, 10, 12, in some situations, even more than that, a, a milligram per kilogram. But when I'm using it in combination with fluoxetine, then I would probably limit myself and I wouldn't go over eight milligram per kilogram. Yeah. yeah. I'm similar. I usually start at the lower end around five make per kg for trazodone mm -hmm. and then increase the dose to the effect that I'm looking for. But very commonly, I'll also add on something like gabapentin um, or clonidine because neither of those increase serotonin in the brain. Yeah. And so that's that's sort of how I approach it. It's not that I'd say no trazodone. I use trazodone and, and fluoxetine or trazodone and clomipramine together. Um, but um, we just have to be you know, cautious about it. Yeah. Still, still trying to aim for labeled dose of the the daily medication if we're yeah. using trazodone as our adjunctive. I yeah. think that um, because people might see that their dog might have tremors or uh, potentially seizures, um, and then they think that their dog is having serotonin syndrome, mm -hmm. whereas true serotonin syndrome, I highly doubt that we're seeing it at the label doses that we're doing. Yeah. No, I think that there's probably tremors can be a side effect. Is there an underlying brain condition? Mm -hmm. uh, because a, a lot of our medications lower the seizure threshold. And so even if your dog hasn't been diagnosed with epilepsy, if we lower that seizure threshold, do they then have a seizure because yeah. of the lowering the seizure threshold? And they already had something in their brain that was contributing right. to that. Like an underlying disease that was just uh, an undiagnosed. Undiagnosed and then masked. And then we give the medication and it unmasks this. Yeah. 
but not not to scare our listeners or people thinking of using it um when even with dogs that we even know that have epilepsy we know that the stress itself can be a cause for seizures and many times a part of the treatment will actually also treat the, the anxiety with those anti-anxiety medications with SSRIs that you know technically can as you as you mentioned reduce the seizure threshold but because they treat the anxiety they actually do just the opposite they reduce the frequency of uh, of seizures and that's why even in cases that were diagnosed with with epilepsy again i would probably start using lower doses than what i usually use but i will still treat them with mm -hmm. uh, medications that potentially can cause uh, this uh, threshold uh, changes yeah yeah so if um if they can identify that uh over arousal or uh hypervigilance contributes to a seizure then i absolutely put them on an ssri i don't have yeah. any problems doing that i know yeah. there's a lot of veterinarians and a lot of the general practitioners that are sending us behavior cases that are more complicated mm -hmm. it's it has to do with the level of comfort of that veterinarian now i yeah. know we just went on a huge like tangent about i mean really we were talking about the side effects of these medications because i think that um i would say that it can be hard when you're a general practitioner to give all of the information that you need to give to that client. You're like, I know that this dog has anxiety, but I really don't have like half an hour to talk about all the side effects of that yeah. come with yeah. that. Um, I mean, there's little hands out speed, then you have to expect the client to read the handouts. So yeah, that they do. But in this day Nobody and age, who's, who's reading anything anymore? Yeah, exactly. If you put it on TikTok, they're listening maybe. to podcasts. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Like on the way, we said, here, here, we're helping everyone. <laughs> if you want us to make like separate episodes on the different medication, like an episode on fluoxetine and an episode on peroxetine and clomipramine and trust like separate episodes, and we can discuss the mechanism, we can discuss the side effects. When it's really, the, really good for etc. studying for boards. <laughs> exactly. Now that's good for us. That's good for you. Just let us know if you want. We're gonna do it. <laughs> it but I think boring. I think that's hey. it for today, right? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> um, as always, if you have any interesting topic or if you want to ask us something, uh that we didn't answer or you want us to clarify things feel free to write us and we'll try and uh, address it as soon as possible sounds good we'll see you soon <laughs> bye everyone <laughs>